Hello everyone and welcome back to Creation Myths. Today we are going to cover the creation myth that mutations are not random. Now before we get into anything today, I just want to briefly clarify what we mean when we say mutations are or are not random. What we really mean is that mutations are probabilistic, right? Meaning they occur according to a probability distribution. When most people hear the word random with regard to mutations, they think it means that every mutation is equally likely. And that's not the case. Some mutations are more likely than others. Some regions of the genome are more likely to mutate than others. So when we say mutations are random, what we mean is they are probabilistic. They are not deterministic or programmed or whatever word you want to use. So for this video for today, we're going to use the words random and probabilistic to mean the same thing. It just means that mutations occur according to a probability distribution. And the creation myth that we're going to cover today is that that is not the case. That instead of being random, mutations are programmed or directed in some way. So with that out of the way, let's talk about this creation myth. The creationist claim here is that instead of being random, mutations are programmed or directed or purposeful or induced or whatever word you want to use that's the opposite of probabilistic. This claim is based on a 2022 paper called Mutation Bias Reflects Natural Selection in Arabidopsis thaliana. Arabidopsis is a plant uh, genetic model organism, and what the, uh, this paper found was that there are region-specific uh, variations in the mutation rate across the genome of Arabidopsis, right? That's the big finding here, that some regions of that genome mutate at a faster rate than other regions. So creationists took this and ran with it, and, you know, it's, I'm recording this in 2024, and they are still running with it. So uh, here's a piece from Discovery Institute from around when this paper came out by Dr. Casey Luskin. New study in Nature showing non-random mutation spells trouble for neo-Darwinism. In my uh, recent conversation with Carissa Shipman and Sal Cordova, which I'll link down below, Carissa actually brought this up. I'm going to cut this clip short because I'm going to not show my kind of counterpoint here because that's what we're talking about here. But I'll just show that she made uh, a claim based on this paper in our conversation here. Take a look. So I think it's important to be specific about, yeah, of course, mutations part of it. but they're finding out like there was a paper on Arabidopsis that was showing that there was programmed mutation, meaning that the plant was mm, selecting. That's not what that paper showed. So obviously this paper has legs in the world of creationism. Why is that the case? Why does this paper matter so much for creationists? Well, I think there are two big reasons why. First is that anything non-random, anything directed, anything that looks uh, purposeful can be used to undermine Darwinism, right? And of course, it's always framed as Darwinism. Sometimes, like uh, with the Casey Luskin piece I showed you previously, you get uh, a neo-Darwinism in there, but a lot of times it's just Darwinism, uh, as was the case, for example, with my conversation with uh, Carissa and Sal. The second reason is that creationists can take anything that looks directed or purposeful and use that uh, to claim that that's evidence of a designer, right? And that can be the case whether the kind of programming is front-loaded, so certain mutations are going to happen um, due to that programming, or whether there is ongoing intervention on the part of the designer and creator. Anything directed, creationists are going to take that and they're going to use it uh, to claim support for some version of creationism or intelligent design creationism. Now, these arguments, I mean, they don't hold up because they ignore how there are lots of non-random mechanisms of evolution. Natural selection is a non-random mechanism of evolution. So something being non-random does not preclude evolutionary theory or evolutionary processes, but that's a bigger point that's beyond the scope of what we're talking about 
here. So why are creationists wrong about this particular claim in this particular paper? Well, it's actually really simple because that's not what the paper says. The paper actually says that Arabidopsis exhibits region-specific mutation rates across the genome, and that rate is lowest in regions where mutations are most likely to be harmful. For example, tightly constrained protein coding regions of the genome. Here are a couple of panels from a figure from this paper. These are two panels from a larger figure that illustrate this point. So uh, the purple lines here, that shows the mutation probability, and the green is the observed number of de novo mutations. And for both sets of panels here, what we're looking at is within a gene, that's the gene body region, and then you've got upstream of the gene and downstream of the gene. Don't worry about the other stuff that's going on here. It's the positions in the genome. It doesn't really matter. What this is showing you is that the lines are higher in the regions immediately adjacent to the gene compared to within the gene itself, right? That's the key thing that this is showing, that there is a lower de novo mutation rate within the gene compared to the flanking regions. That's what these data are showing. This is explained in the paper via natural selection. It's adaptive to reduce the mutation rate in critical regions via chemical modification, via epigenetic modification, and stabilization of the DNA. So we have, again, two panels of a figure from this paper here showing what's going on, right? We have regions that are going to be enriched for epigenetic markers. So that's going to be these purple kind of guitar picks right here. Those are epigenetic modifications of the DNA. And then the density of the epigenetic modifications is correlated with the frequency of a region being targeted by proteins that are either going to protect the DNA from mutation or repair mutations rapidly once they occur. So what you can see in this panel on the right here is you have genes that are highly active, very important, highly constrained. They're going to have a very high density of epigenetic regulation and therefore are very frequently targeted by these protective and repair proteins, whereas regions that are less essential will have a lower level of targeting. This means that the mutation rate, the rate at which one nucleotide changes to another, will be lowest in the most critical parts of the genome. That's the implications of what this is showing. The really cool thing about this is we have a clear explanation for why just those regions of the genome have a lower mutation rate. All of this stuff, epigenetic modification, repair proteins, all of that stuff costs energy. So if you're applying it to a region of the genome that's critical, that's worth the trade-off, right? You're going to take a little bit of a hit because you're using the energy to modify and, and repair the DNA, right? That's an energetically costly enterprise. But it's worth it for the regions that are tightly constrained where any mutations are likely to be costly. But for the regions in the genome that are less constrained, less important, or have no function at all, then you don't want to apply those costly mechanisms. It's not worth the energy you would put into it. So we can see how selection would lead to these mechanisms only operating in the most critical parts of the genome, hence the findings in this paper. The authors described it like this, quote, Our findings reveal adaptive mutation bias that is mediated by a link between mutation rate and the epigenome. This is mechanistically plausible in light of evidence that DNA repair factors can be recruited by specific features of the epigenome. Hypomutation targeted to features enriched in functionally constrained loci throughout the genome would reduce the relative frequency of deleterious mutations. In other words, natural selection explains these findings. No design or programmed mutations or deterministic mutations needed. So that settles it. But if that's not good enough for you, that's okay, because this question of whether mutations are probabilistic or induced or programmed or whatever, that was directly tested experimentally in 1943. I'm talking, of course, about the famous Luria-Delbruck fluctuation test. In this experiment, the researchers grew bacterial populations, which I'm showing in this figure in light purple here. 
So they're growing these bacterial populations and they're diverging them from each other. So you end up, you start with a common ancestor and you end up with a bunch of different bacterial populations. You expose all of those descendant populations to bacteriophages, viruses that infect the bacteria, and then you document the frequency of resistance in those descendant populations. The question that we want to answer with this experiment is were the resistance mutations induced by the virus? And fortunately, we have an answer. The answer is no, those mutations are probabilistic. We know this is the case because the two possible explanations, induced mutations and not induced, lead to very different, opposite in fact, specific predictions. If the mutations are induced, which is shown in the panel or the column on the left here, if those mutations are induced, then we should see an approximately equal number of resistant colonies on each plate, right? The frequency of resistance should be approximately equal across all of the different iterations of the experiment. If the mutations are not induced, that means that the mutations that confer resistance must have occurred somewhere in the brief evolutionary history of these different bacterial lineages. So some populations are going to have a lot of resistance because the mutation occurred early in its history. Some populations might have very little because the resistance mutation occurred very late in its evolutionary history, or maybe not at all. Maybe there won't be any resistance at all. So if the mutations are not induced, we expect a wide variation in the frequency of resistance. What do we actually find when we do this experiment? We find extreme variation in resistance, meaning the specific mutations for virus resistance are not induced. In other words, mutations are probabilistic, not directed, not non-random. This is direct experimental evidence. So in summary, creationists often claim, based on a 2022 paper, that mutations are induced or programmed or directed, whatever word you would like to use. They ignore what that paper actually says, sometimes even claiming that specific individual mutations were induced, which is just not even close to what that paper says, even in the wildest retellings. There's no way to get that out of that paper, but that's what some creationists will claim. In reality, the paper expands on something already known. Mutation rate is a phenotype that is subject to selection, and that selection can operate locally or regionally within a genome, leading to regions that have been selected to have a higher or lower mutation rate. And if that's not good enough, that's okay, because direct experimental evidence from 1943 shows conclusively that mutations are probabilistic. So, mutations aren't random? That is a creation myth. Thank you for watching. Please remember to subscribe to the channel, uh, hit the like button, leave a comment if you are so inclined, and if you appreciate what I'm doing here, please consider becoming a channel member channel members get immediate access to my pre-recorded videos instead of having to wait for the public release. That means sometimes you get a video a day or two ahead of time, sometimes you get it a week or two weeks or maybe even a month or two ahead of time, depending on if I can kind of get ahead of the game a little bit and record a few things early and then put them out, you know, over time. Thank you for watching. Don't get fooled.